Athena and I'm Layla. Welcome back to our channel Elementary My Dear where we make nutrition science easy for you to digest. Today we're answering all of Reddit's burning questions. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss one of our videos. I'm a huge writer. I mostly am on it for internet drama, r slash relationship advice, r slash am I the asshole. I've only gotten into the Reddit game very recently. Mm -hmm. A lot of people on Reddit have questions mm -hmm. and we're here, we're here for to, you. We're here to answer all your nutrition questions. Yeah. We might have guest appearances occasionally. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Hi, this is my cat, Lulu. Yeah. All right, so should we jump on in to yeah. r slash nutrition? We'll scroll through and we'll find some of the best questions that r slash nutrition has to offer. Oh, the first, should we look at this rant? Oh, it's a rant. So I actually took a look at the nutrition facts and I'm kind of mad at myself. I've made previous posts about getting a bike and some other steps I've taken and the things I wanted to do diet wise. Well, I finally decided to take a look at nutrition facts of the pizza rolls. You get almost the same amount of calories from six rolls as you do from a can of soda. I think even more. And I ate these things like 30 at a time. I have been probably 1,000 calories and 200 grams of carbs for lunch almost every day. A lot of times when people want to lose weight, people feel like they need to change everything about mm -hmm. their diet all at once. They want to go work out. They want to only eat salads. They only mm -hmm. want to eat the chicken and the rice and the broccoli or whatever and make all of those changes. But I think this kind of thing shows that sometimes it could be just like one small change that actually has yeah. a really big impact. Looking at the nutrition facts table is also really valuable. It's not very intuitive to always know what nutrients or calories or whatever that a product can offer. Taking a look at it to see if it fits into what you're looking for for is absolutely a good idea. This person brings into light like how much you're eating. So if you love pizza rolls, like just because you're on a diet or your, if your goal is weight loss and, and you're trying to be in a caloric deficit, doesn't mean that you need to completely cut mm -hmm. out of your pizza rolls. If you enjoy eating them, have, I don't think they said like six over like the 30 and maybe have them as a side with something that's gonna be a little bit more nutrient dust and filling if your goal is to lose weight, which I, it seems like this person's is. Oh, it looks like there were a lot of people that were very supportive. Oh, okay, let's see what the top comment is saying. I've been counting calories on and off for years and still get shocked. Recently, I bought these 100 calorie flavored pretzels as a healthy alternative to chips. I counted out the serving and it was 16 pretzels, which in my bowl looked tiny. I would have eaten the whole package before and eaten closer to 500 calories from a mm. low calorie snack. I think that's a really good point because I think that a lot of times it's on the package will be like, yeah, it's 100 calories per serving and the serving is like, yeah two little things. It's insane. Even for bars and stuff, a lot of nutrition facts table is for half the bar. One, one third of a bar. And you're like, who's, who's eating, eating that? half the bar? It's so misleading. I believe there's plans to change regulations mm -hmm. for that to be realistic portions or standard across like all yeah. similar products. Has that already been done? I don't, I don't think so. I think that like they were, they were supposed to do it and then Health Canada was like, oh, COVID guys, I guess you're, you don't yeah. have to, which I was like. They gave them more time to do to it. it. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think that this brings up a great point is that like you're buying something and they specifically market it as like, a low calorie snack. A lot of popcorns too, it'll be like 35 calories a cup. Like who, who's, who's only eating, eating a cup a of popcorn? popcorn? Like, honestly, I'm out there eating the whole bag. I know in the UK, their nutrition facts labels, it's for the product, like if it's a bar or whatever, and then they all also have it per hundred grams. grams and i think the intention there is to be able to compare mm -hmm. products more easily i think that's a great strategy and unfortunately we don't have it here we have like the present daily value i kind of find that confusing sometimes because that's also based on the portion size and i feel like these companies like they know what people are looking for they're looking for low calories so they're going to do every loophole they can to put the lowest number of calories on the label yeah this one yeah do you want to do that yeah. one? this person is asking does total protein intake actually matter if you're getting all the amino acids you need? So this is a hypothetical question the person says, is there any difference if one were to eat the recommended amount of protein versus eating very little protein, but in getting the same amount of essential amino acids from supplements? This person's basically wondering if the volume of total protein actually matters or if it's just a matter of getting the necessary amount of amino acids. The context of that is amino acids are the building blocks of protein. And when you eat protein, your body basically breaks it down into amino acids and then absorbs the amino acids. And then in your body, will use those amino acids to build all the structures and hormones and whatever that it needs to make. And I think this is a really interesting question. Why? Do, yeah. Why would anyone need to know this? And, and like, is this coming from a place of like, oh, just pure, <laughs> Pure intellectual curiosity, curiosity, or if the person is 
practically wondering if they could just get a bunch of supplements and not worry about eating protein. To answer this question, from a hypothetical sense, purely, is the amino acids you're taking in equal to the protein that you're taking in? Would you be okay? The answer is yes. Like, from a purely protein-specific protein. standpoint, the answer is it is the same. You're gonna use those amino acids in the same way. If anything, you might use a little less energy processing those amino acids. There's something called the thermic effect of food, which is actually how much energy your body uses in the process of digesting food. Protein actually has the highest thermic effect of food of all three macronutrients, which means that you use more energy to break down and absorb protein than you do for carbohydrates and fats. If you're taking in amino acids, a lot of that work's already done for you. you use less energy to digest it. Outside the protein context, mm -hmm. in terms of overall food and nutrition and how it affects your body, there absolutely is a huge difference. Absolutely. First of all, we're not eating these nutrients like protein in isolation, mm -hmm. and pretty much every protein-rich whole food comes with a lot of other nutrients as well. For example, a lot of animal products come with zinc, iron, and B12. Not only that, because you're eating a food that has more than just the protein, you're gonna feel full and satisfied so you could actually function in the day. Mm -hmm. I feel like if I was just consuming amino acid supplements, I'd be pretty hungry and cranky. Yeah, also, I just like eating food. Why is this <laughs> even a question? I mean, it is a hypothetical question. I mean, it's a, it's it's a, a valid question. It's a good science-based question. Yes. It's a good science-based question. I think a pure nutrition scientist would love this question. Dietitian are like, but like why? why? What's interesting is actually in the hospital setting, a lot of times if someone has a really compromised digestive system, as part of a medical treatment, there's a thing called an elemental diet where mm -hmm. things like carbs, fats, and proteins they're all broken down into their individual components, amino acids, glucose, and fatty acids. People are given that. It's a way to nourish someone when their digestive system is not functioning adequately. Mm -hmm. But this is almost like a last resort type situation. It's not even meant to be used long term. Sure, at all, yeah. And I know, though, A, those formulas are really expensive, but also I know as soon as someone's gut is working properly, you okay. want to get them on like a normal full formula as soon as possible. Like those are used exactly in a last resort kind of situation. So I wonder what would happen to your enzymes and stuff like if you were just eating straight amino acids. That's a good question. You know, a lot of people, there are enzyme supplements too, like mm -hmm. digestive enzymes. Will your body compensate by producing less? Do you know if they're in any long term? This is a completely separate I question. Hey, we should put it on our <laughs> tradition. Um, honestly, I have no idea, but I thought like those adjusted enzymes were for, for people who had like pancreatic insufficiency. Are you telling me that there's, pe there's regular people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are people that just have it with before every meal. And it's not even like lactase, oh. like because you know you have an insufficiency. Yeah. Weird. Did not know that. I can't say I'd recommend that. Hi. Hi, Lulu. Generally, the dietetic steps. <laughs> Are you having a good time? Your body breaks down proteins for the amino acids. So if you were hypothetically getting enough of each amino acid, you would be a-okay just having amino acids, but you'd be missing out on a lot of other nutrients that you get from whole foods and it'd be very expensive. Okay, on next, question. next question. Question about the alkaline diet. We love questions about the alkaline diet. We love the diet. alkaline diet. <laughs> Everywhere I read online seems to suggest that there's no evidence to support the alkaline diet. Very good. Pro-alkaline dieters say that eating more alkaline-inducing foods Foods as metabolic products have alkaline inducing effects, not necessarily foods with a base alkaline pH, fights inflammation, reduces cancer, and all sorts of other claims. Anti-alkaline diet proprietors claim that the body is very well adapted at maintaining pH regardless of what you eat. So even if your urine displays high alkaline levels, your blood and body are still in balance. But what about how much your body has to fight to maintain balance? Has this been studied? It's a really weird, question because what are like, I, I think the premise of the question is flawed right mm. i think the person believes that yes your body will maintain ph but if you're eating foods that are acidic then your body will have to fight to bring it to homeostasis or if you're eating too much basic foods then your body's again gonna have to fight to bring it to its homeostasis mm -hmm. that in and of itself is not correct. This idea that being more alkaline is a good thing, I just don't really know where this came from. And also, 
where this idea that foods can create your body being more alkaline. I wonder if it's just that acid, the word, it has a fearful, like it's gonna hurt me, uh, it's gonna burn or like, you know what I mean? It yeah. has a harmful connotation to it inherently. Mm -hmm. But in some paradigms or ways of thinking, our digestive system, the digestive tract in and of itself is almost not viewed as being inside your body because in a way it's kind of just a long hole or tube going from mouth to anus in a long convoluted way where a lot of stuff is happening and it's obviously interacting with the inside of your body but it's sometimes not viewed as actually being inside your body most of the acid basic ph balance that happens in our blood is more about waste products like things like carbon dioxide or like waste products from breaking things down the byproducts mm -hmm. of various metabolic processes the food that you're eating is not actually, you know, it's not immediately like going into your blood and changing the pH and then your body's like having to fight really hard to bring it back to what it was. That's not what's happening. And I think that was the, the premise of the of this question. question. This person accepts the fact that it'll maintain that balance, but if this person thinks that- So they're like, stress your body out trying to maintain that balance. Exactly. And when we talk about digestion, your body is actually producing a lot of acid and that acid is really important in terms of breaking down protein and activating enzymes and doing all these different things for the most part your body has to get to a certain ph in your stomach so even if you ate like something very alkaline it might affect your stomach ph slightly but your stomach is still going to be very acidic and that's a good thing. thing so you can digest proteins and get all your amino acids in it's going to arrive in your small intestine and it's going to become basic so it doesn't burn the mucosa or like the lining of your intestines again that's intentional, intentional. and that's your body doing that it if your body is out of whack, that is a medical emergency. That is a medical emergency. You need to go to the hospital. Okay, let's look up the alkaline diet. See, Lulu, exactly, Lulu. Exactly. It's ridiculous. I think she wants some love. Oh, hi, baby. <laughs> hi, baby. Oh, hi. Hi. She's very needy, this Aww. girl. So, there's just not a, like a strong congruency. The takeaway is that the anti-alkaline diet people are correct and that your body does maintain pH very well and your diet and what you're eating has very little to no effect on the actual blood pH. You're not putting stress on your body by eating a high acidic or a high alkaline diet. I will say like having a diet that focuses on like fruits and vegetables, that is generally a healthy diet. If you want to follow the alkaline diet, like it's not bad for you, but it's not doing this. It's not good for you because of the alkalinity nature of it. Also, th whatever they're calling alk, it's not- That also seems to be very flawed. A lot of the foods that they're recommending on this type of eating pattern is a lot more fruits and vegetables, water, and like limiting consumption of things like alcohol and red meat and pop. So like, yeah, I, I think you're gonna probably see health benefits from doing this diet. The mechanism through which they're claiming that benefit's gonna be happening is flawed. Like, and honestly, if you want to learn more about alkaline diets, specifically alkaline water, we did a whole video about that. When was that? Few months ago. Like a year ago? A long, long time, time ago. ago. Check that out. We talk more about uh, alkaline water specifically and kind of what that means and if there any benefits compared to regular non alkaline water. water. <laughs> okay, let's okay. scroll through. All right. Oh, what about this one? Yes. What foods gain or lose most nutrition value when cooked? The question is, I know that most foods lose some or most nutritional value when cooked, but which ones lose the most? On the flip side, which ones gain nutritional value from cooking? We've had a lot of our messaging around nutrition very individual nutrient focused. And I think that's where this kind of question comes from. Yeah, this is a really good question. And it's true, you know, with cooking and high heat, there's certain nutrients that are lost and there's certain nutrients that are actually, believe it or not, enhanced. One of the nutrients that's enhanced is actually lycopene, which is a red pigment. Like when you think of things like tomatoes, cooking it actually enhances that nutritional value and you're able to get more out of it. And the other benefit of cooking is that it can inactivate certain anti-nutrients, things like phytates. So that actually also just helps your body able to absorb all the other nutrients that the food has to offer. A lot of times, like when things are raw, it's really hard for your body to break it down and get 
at all those nutrients that are in there. Sometimes cooking things can help you better absorb all kinds of different nutrients. But on the flip side, things like vitamin C are very, very heat sensitive. Even like cooking it very quickly, you're gonna lose a lot of your vitamin C. If you're cooking things in water, water soluble vitamins, those can go into the water. If you're making something like a soup and you're consuming the water or the liquid, it wouldn't really be a loss in that sense. One thing to note is that cooking at really high temperatures, things like barbecuing, that could lead to formation of things like heterocyclic amines that can be harmful, like those are linked to cancer. Cooking at super high temperatures mm -hmm. for a long time, there could be some harmful compounds that come from that. This is like just a very complex question overall because we aren't eating individual nutrients, we're eating foods that are so, so complex. I'm assuming that the person wants to ask this question to know how to get the most nutrition out of their food. The way to get the most nutrition out of your food is just to eat a wide variety of food, and prepare them in a wide variety of ways. And that way, you know, if you're going to have raw tomato for something, you're going to get the vitamin C aspect and some of those other nutrients. Whereas if you're then going to have like a tomato sauce that you're cooking, you're going to get more of the lycopene. Our takeaway with for this question, as always, is just having a wide, berry <laughs> diet, eat the rainbow, <laughs> Cook some of it, don't cook some of it. I don't think it's worth nitpicking this hard. It's partially maybe nutrition science and the way it's been communicated in the past. There's been a lot of like focus on individual nutrients. Mm -hmm. I think now we're learning that looking at food in that way is not very useful. One example that comes to mind is fish consumption has been linked to certain positive health outcomes. We thought it was the omega-3 based on certain biological mechanisms. It seemed like it was the omega-3 that was having these positive impacts. But then for whatever reason, we don't see that same positive impact with just omega-3 supplementation. So obviously there's something to the whole food, the entire food matrix that's contributing to those positive health outcomes. It's not just those individual nutrients in isolation. I think that's been like a major flaw of nutrition science from like the very beginning, because you'll remember the demonization of fat and they're like, oh, okay, now we have to replace fat with something and it didn't fix the issue that, that they thought it was. And now it's, I don't know, we're always just picking like a demon nutrient and like a, an amazing angel nutrient. Demonized fat, so you replaced fat with sugar. Now it's demonizing sugar, sugar so replacing it with non-nutritive artificial sweeteners. sweeteners. Now we're honestly in the process of demonizing those. I don't know what's gonna come next. We don't eat nutrients, we eat food. Being so nitpicky, I feel like it's like overly stressful when the really unsexy, boring answer is just like eat a variety of things, eat less processed things and prepare them in different ways. This recommendation is more for the generally healthy population. Mm -hmm. If you have a very specific condition where you do need to monitor intake of specific things, then obviously work with your doctor and your healthcare team to do that. But yeah, for the generally healthy population that is just looking to have a healthy diet, wide and varied diet is your answer. Questions like this that come up, I think people that are interested in eating healthier when you start hearing people talk about stuff like this i think you can start feeling overwhelming mm -hmm. to the point where it actually deters people from even starting that journey to maybe make those small changes in their diet like eating a little more fruits and vegetables because they're like well i don't know if i need to cook it i don't have time to cook it i don't know how to cook it or oh if i eat it raw like something focusing on those little details can sometimes feel overwhelming and actually deter people from even doing that important step of incorporating more fruits and vegetables into their diet which is often the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to nutrition and health. When you look at the research, that is the yeah. biggest bang for your buck, is more fruits and vegetable consumption, independent on lowering consumption of other foods. That was fun, I think we should do that again. I know, I love this. Also like, <laughs> r slash nutrition, if you ever have any questions, reach out to us directly. And we're gonna do it again. All right, good work. Yeah. That was a great high five. That was really good, was actually. Really good. I, I struggle with high fives often. I feel like we tend to have good high okay. five chemistry. I, I think you might have jinxed it now. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you never miss one of our videos. And follow us on our Instagram and our TikTok. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye.